Okay, you ready? Yeah. All right. Uh, who are you and where are we? I'm Claire Ashcroft. I'm a first year student here at Capital University in Bexley, Ohio. And tell us about the organization you run. This, this is uh, two organizations. Tell us about them. Yeah, so I run both the Doubters Club and Bridge USA. And Bridge USA is about having viewpoint diversity, constructive dialogue, and solution-oriented politics. So we're really looking to bring people together of different perspectives um, to have a more productive political environment. And the Doubters Club is similar, but more focused on philosophy and religion. It's a bunch of friends that come together once a month to discuss truth. Wow, those sound like great things. And tell us a little bit about the university. What's the shtick? It's a religious university. Uh, yes, we're officially a Lutheran university, um, but no one's forced to attend any religious services. Our student population is actually uh, mostly Catholic, interestingly enough. Um, but we're a small uh, liberal arts university, um, pretty small community, and all of the professors are really here to help you succeed. So. Well, that's pretty great. So what made you reach out to us for the reverse Q&A? Yeah, I've just been following your work uh, ever since I saw the resignation letter, and I thought it was very admirable. I read through it, and I agreed with a lot of it, and so um, I saw it in the Substack, and I knew that this was something that I would love to be a part of. Great. And is there a problem on campus with lack of viewpoint diversity? Um, I would say so. Most of the professors that I've talked to um, seem open to the ideas and helping me out with my clubs, but in actual classes, uh, they don't really want to facilitate that sort of dialogue themselves um, or are nervous to. And I have had students when recruiting for my organizations just say, like, if anyone who wants me to talk to a Republican, I'm set in my views. I don't want to hear any conservative opinions. What should we talk about tonight? Um, everything, the long and short of it. Um, I think social justice, free speech issues are always important. Um, religion is an important part of this campus. Really, yeah, everything. <laughs> What are you hoping to get out of the event tonight? I'm hoping that students maybe who haven't been open in the past to hearing other ideas uh, might show up and really realize the value. And the fact that other people, just because they disagree, doesn't mean they aren't reasonable, right? People can be reasonable and rational and good people and still have very differing opinions um, based on their experiences where they come from. So I hope they learn to hear out other people's experiences and how that leads to the beliefs that they have. So I'm trying to I'm close my eyes because I want to capture your words correctly. People can be reasonable and rational and still have different opinions. Did you say that? Have you found that attitude to be um, unpopular on one end of the political spectrum? Yeah, I, I would say the far left particularly um, are the ones who mostly feed into that the other side is evil and they're against my entire identity, right? If they're against this certain law, then that means they're against me entirely and they hate me. Um, and I think that's something that definitely needs to be eradicated. And it certainly exists on both extremes, but I think it's, it's definitely more prevalent on the far left right now. Because that's what I was thinking, too. If someone on the far left believes that, but yet they don't want to listen to the people who hold other beliefs, then how can they ever come to the conclusion that the belief they hold about people who want to deny their identity and people who think they're evil, if they're not willing to listen to them in the first place, how do, how do they dig themselves out of that pit? That's the difficult thing is interacting with students who don't want to hear the other side and they deem it evil. And I'm like, well, if you're not willing to hear them out, then you don't really know. But what I would like to try and do is have them build on the relationships they already have with people who may not be so open about their beliefs. Um, like for me, what brought me to this work a lot was my family. I disagree with them politically, but I'm stuck with them. They're my family. So if they have pre-existing friends or family that they may disagree with to really maintain those relationships and those bridges that they have between those people, um, and that might help them better understand the other side. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so just while I'm thinking about it, did you contact the other university clubs here and invite them from other universities? Yes, I contacted other universities um, and I didn't have much luck with responses. Um, I contacted a few universities on campus um, and some of them are more receptive than others. But interestingly, um, a lot of them, like particularly the Education Society said, because they're going to be state employees in the future, they're afraid of speaking on any sort of policy or legislation that may get passed in the future and, and having that on the record. So I think it's a culture of fear that's not just on universities, but it's about future employment as well. Yeah, totally. So that's the thing that we've found over and over again. Like we'll interview people and they'll say, <clears throat> we'll talk to you, but not on camera. 
And I say, okay. And then the stuff they tell us, they don't want to go on camera because they're afraid. It's a culture of fear. So then people don't come to the events because they're afraid. So what do we do if no one, if, well, what do we do? It's an impossible, I mean, well, I think, I mean, do you have a solution? Yeah, um, I don't really have a solution except to keep doing the work that I'm doing and hope that people hear it and come unafraid. Um, a lot of our discussions are internal, you know, Bridge USA and the Doubters Club, we're all friends there um, and we hear each other out and we don't have cameras in that room. So I hope that people can begin to overcome self-censorship among friends and then hopefully they'll be more comfortable sharing their opinions with the public in the future. Yeah, so that's a problem. The problem is if you don't have cameras there, the conversations are probably more honest, but then you'll have people afraid, like on the app Clubhouse, that they're going to be recorded and it's going to be held against them. But if you don't have cameras there, then you can't share with the public, then the public can't understand what's on people's minds. But you can't do that if people won't come to the event in the first place. So it's a, right? It's a Yeah, it, it definitely is. I'm just trying my best to get people to understand this perspective and this uh, way of thinking and sharing that and sharing the examples that I can offer freely um, and hoping that at some point the fever breaks, essentially. Yeah. All right, cool. That's all I have. Do you have any questions for me or anything you want to comment on or ask or say anything at all? Uh, sure. I'll, I'll ask you what spurred this idea to go across the United States to all these different campuses to do this event. The idea that I wanted to platform different students, students who had diverging beliefs, are students who weren't sure about the orthodoxy. And I also wanted to figure out why people believe things and to give them a tool, one simple tool to how to, and you'll see, we'll do it tonight. Then maybe two tools, but certainly one tool. <laughs> so just something that they can use as they move forward. Does that, that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Anything else? No. All right, we're good. I don't know. Let's do a fist bump. Let's do that. Okay, we're good. Are right, we good? What brought you to this event today? So, a lot of things. Um, I've been a college student since about 2016, and I feel like since that time, things have just been progressing downhill in terms of free speech. Um, you know, I'm a law student right now, and I think it's really important for people to have discussions that are difficult and have kind of that free discourse in order to not only educate ourselves, but to have just a better perspective on the world and to be prepared for, you know, the real world. And I just feel like we're not getting that in the classroom. Um, in many of my classes, I feel like one side has kind of got a voice, and it's a very strong one. Um, but everyone is very hesitant to kind of share, you know, minority viewpoints and just different viewpoints that maybe we wouldn't think are such contra controversial things to say, but end up, you know, having a lot of backlash, um, whether it's behind your back or if it's like public retaliation, you know, and a lot of times professors don't support that kind of freedom discourse either. So I just feel like, you know, I'm tired of not hearing people talk about it and I want to hear people talk about it. Uh, I've been following a... Uh, uh the Professor Bogosian's work for some time and uh, read the book and big fan and I uh, just happened to stumble across this somehow Instagram I think <laughs> I'm with a group called FAIR Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism and Dr. Bogosian is an advisor to that group so that's how I heard about the event uh, invitation by students to come um, I am a member of Socialist Student Union I was just interested to hear the talk and everything that everyone has to say so yeah I've been following sort of the discourse around, I guess, you know, discussions of controversial topics, specifically with regards to things like critical race theory and some of the don't get, say gay legislation that's been coming out. And so I thought that it would be interesting to see the perspectives of people who are concerned about, I guess, that sort of free speech crusade, if you'd want to call it that. What are you expecting? I'm expecting things to be a little uncomfortable because nobody really wants to share these issues that we're having. Nobody wants to say what it is they're not allowed to say. So I'm expecting kind of some vague comments about, yeah, some things are just not cool to talk about. It's like, what is it that you're not supposed to say? And what are the threats that people are seeing? Why is it this way? And maybe just trying to share a little bit of insight on ways that we can improve the situation if we can, which I hope we can. I don't really know what to expect. And that is exciting to me. Uh, just to learn as much as I can from a, uh, an individual that has been on the front lines of this topic. Uh, well, the talk's on social justice, and I deal with that all the time, and so I'm hoping to learn some new tips and definitions and fully understand it more. 
I do not know. I, I'm just looking forward to a good dialogue and good conversation. I don't know. I guess we'll see. I don't really have any expectations or anything, so I'm just kind of here to see what happens, yeah. I'm not 100% sure what to expect. I did some research on who we've brought in, so I kind of have an idea of like where he stands on some things, but obviously the event is more about the students, so I'm really curious to see what the students are going to bring to the discussion. What are you hoping for? Hoping for tonight or in the world or in yeah, universities of oh, tonight. Um, I'm just hoping to feel a little bit redeemed, a little bit um, supported and encouraged so that as I go forth, not only in my you know school career, but you know, into the rest of the world that I feel more comfortable sharing things that I think are important to talk about. Challenging answers to challenging questions. Good news. Good news that uh, he sees a good light at the end of his fight. Hoping to expand my knowledge. To learn something. <laughs> Always good to learn something every day. I, I don't know. I don't really have any expectations, so I don't really have any hopes. I don't think either. That's not, probably not the most exciting answer, but... Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's all I got. I'm sort of hoping to gain an understanding of what people are concerned about when it comes to discussion of different ideas. I think that this will be a really good platform for that to happen. Do you feel personally feel free to express your opinion about controversial subjects in the classroom? Absolutely not. And it definitely, you know, it ranges. I might feel slightly more comfortable if I know the professor and if I know that they care about free speech and they care about that sort of philosophical discourse. Um, and I'll feel absolutely not comfortable in, in classes where I know that, you know, there's going to be controversial topics. So the more controversial, uh, the less comfortable I am. And I've just noticed that even when I do speak up, other people who have similar views tend to not join in. They'll tell me later in private, oh, thank you for saying this, but they'll never actually join in and support in the classroom. And I think that's a big issue that I'd like for us to work through. Uh, no, uh, that is a uh, very definite no. Uh, I have been a teacher uh, in the past, and uh, yeah, you have to uh, tailor your answers to the particular institution and or group of students that you're working with. Oh, yes. Anytime. I, I feel that uh, freedom of speech and being honest and telling the truth is very, very important. You know, I didn't used to be, but this past year and a half, I've learned to be very outspoken. I do, with humility, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm a political science major, so I frequently am in this position to express controversial opinions, and I always feel comfortable doing so, so yeah. Well, I suppose that depends on the controversial subject. I think that some of the description of the classroom, particularly more from right-wing perspectives, is not entirely accurate. It's not, you know, I don't feel afraid to express a lot of like right-wing or left-wing opinions are anywhere. Oftentimes people are very comfortable with right-wing opinions. So I think for the most part, I'm pretty comfortable to say whatever. All right, hello everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name's Claire Ashcraft. I'm a capital student, a uh, philosophy and English student, uh, and the founder of Bridge USA and the Doubters Club at Capital. I've dedicated the past years of my life to the work of civil dialogue, of overcoming self-censorship, fighting polarization, and bringing the country back together. And much of that work starts at the university level because we are the ones who will be running institutions in the next several years. And that's why I'm so excited about our event tonight. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Bogosian. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome everybody and thanks for coming tonight. So. Here's what we're going to do tonight. We have lines on the floor, and we're going to do a little activity. And the purpose of the activity is to give people some tools to speak across divides. We're going to watch a film by Travis Brown. Travis, can you raise your hand? We're going to watch a brief clip from a film about some problems. I, I don't think that they're as prevalent at all on this campus, but about ideology seeping in and free speech on campus and what people can and cannot say. I'm going to show you a tool that you can use. It's free, it's easy, it's so simple to do, but it's a way to achieve consensus on what seems like an impossible problem. So I'm going to add that. This is the first time we've done it. These guys don't even know about that. So we're going to add that into the mix. But for right now, we're going to start off with a brief film. It's called The Woke Reformation. And without further ado, we'll play the clip, we'll do the consensus exercise, and then we'll do the 
lines on the floor Likert scale. My name's Corey Drayton. I'm a motion picture cinematographer and have been for almost 20 years now, actually a little more than 20 years. My experience with cancer is akin to witnessing the spread of woke ideology. This ideology infects people, corrodes our institutions, news media, politicians, and even our ability to speak to one another. Sometimes the only way to get rid of cancer is to cut it out, and the only way to stop the corrosive spread of woke ideology and keep it from eating away at every aspect of our society is to make the necessary incisions and to be chemotherapy. Create an environment in which the cancer cannot thrive. Speak up when you see it and point out its lies. So you'll be happy to know that Corey's cancer is in remission. I just saw Corey, what, a couple months ago, Travis? Um, and he's doing well. The reason that I wanted to show that particular clip for a few reasons, well, we, 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 we consulted with you about which clip we should show, but the reason that we chose to have that to show the, the, the clips from this is because if you want to solve problems, there is simply only one way to do it. You can't hope for the best. You can't flip a coin. You have to talk to each other. But the problem is where we should be talking to each other, we're actually not talking to each other. That's my own suspicions for why uh, podcasts like Joe Rogan, et cetera, are so astonishingly popular because people, from Aristotle, people have a hunger to know. They want to know what's true. And the way that you get to know what's true is through disagreement. And we're not modeling civil disagreement. So with that, I'm going to try something totally experimental tonight. So I'm going to flip around this board. I published a paper on this a few years ago. And... Here are the topics that were written on the board. I have some of my own topics that will add to this too, but I'm going to read these out loud. Anybody can do this. I, was a, uh, I worked as a, um, I, I ran for office actually in the Columbia River Correctional Facility, which is where I did my dissertation with prison inmates. My dissertation was on how to help prison inmates to think critically and morally to desist from crime. So I went back and I ran for office and I got it, and I would use this technique at every one of our meetings. So people would write a topic that they want to, well, in this context, people write a topic that they want to talk about. This is a variation of what's called the Delphi technique. If you ever go into public life or manage meetings, you can do this any, with anybody. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pick topics that we're going to talk about tonight, and we're going to pick them by an odd way of voting. Uh, why don't we give two people two votes to start? The topic with the fewest votes is going to get erased from the board, and then we're going to have another iteration, and then we're going to use those questions to put online. Who wants to talk about, can you share your opinion in class? One, two. Affirmative action. Capital punishment. Gender identity. Okay. Ten. Critical race theory. Uh, Anti-LGBT legislation. Group think is a problem on campus. Defunding the police. One, two. I'm going to put myself, that was my, one of my votes. Um, gender wage gap. No, no. no fly zone in Ukraine. <laughs> two, I <laughs> put that my own question. Do um, uh, you think certain viewpoints are more acceptable to say on campus than others? Zero. Homelessness. Okay. So watch what you do. So this is how you build a consensus among people who would ordinarily not agree. This is one way. You just erase the zeros. What is that? Nine? Not, so we've got nine, eight, two. You have some cut off. Okay. So now we're going to do this. We're going to repeat another iteration of this. Uh, can you share your opinion in class? Do you think group think is a problem on campus? Gender identity. You can vote back there too. Critical race theory. Anti-LGBTQ legislation. I'm trusting everybody that's only voting twice. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Defunding the police. I'm gonna vote for that one. I love that one. All I think mine are gonna be consistently outvoted. Uh, no fly zone in class. <laughs> and Ukraine. Okay, well I'm one. So then you get to think, how many of these do we have time for? Probably three, but now I'm going to leave the numbers on the board. So that's, 
a no-go. Three is the lowest. So four goes. Now my guess is that we have time at least for two, if not three. So how are we going to do that? We're going to rank order these. So this is going to go first. This is going to go second. That's going to, we almost definitely won't have time for that. So that's a version of the Delphi technique. Is that clear? All right. Tell me later if you think that was a good use of time, because if it is, we'll do it again. If not, we'll can it for the next event. So I'm going to call people down and you're going to stand on this line. This is the neutral line. I have three volunteers. Okay, good. We got one. Excellent. Thank you. We could do it with one person, I suppose. Two. Excellent. Okay, and we have additional claims, too. Three. All right, awesome. Come on down. Oh, this is a good one. Biological males should not compete in women's sports. Three, two, one, move. So you're strongly agree to the claim biological males should not compete in women's sports. Can you tell us why you think that? Uh, I think it would be better to have trans sports teams. Does that seem practical to you? Uh, if there's enough, then certainly it would probably be practical to do. Two would be enough. Yes. One would win every event. Yes. Okay. Uh, I completely disagree with that because, you know, one, the trans women are women, but also like going into that, there are women who are biologically defined as women that have higher testosterone levels than people who are biologically defined as males. So like there is a certain difference with that, but um, telling someone, no, you were born a male, you can't participate in this women's sports team, even though you are a woman is kind of BS if you ask me. And I, I mean, like gender differences in certain sports is a whole other topic anyways, but like I mean, they're a woman. They should be able to participate in women's sports. If everything you said was accurate and, f and uh, accorded with reality, why don't we have, why don't we just eliminate all divisions entirely if there are no differences between men and women? Did anything she say convince you to change? No. Why not? Uh, well, I mean, I do see the research as well uh, that I think there is. I think it's lazy to just put them on women's teams or men's teams. I think. Lazy on behalf of who? On be uh, the organization. Uh, of the so that you're speaking to his point. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think that sports would be a lot more interesting if we stopped doing men and women's sport, but we instead broke it down like wrestling has weight classes, boxing has weight classes. Good. Give him a round of applause. Okay. So one of, the, one of the things you can do with this is you can calibrate your beliefs. What do I mean by calibrate your beliefs? You can figure out where you stand on a scale to make it more likely that your beliefs accord to what you articulate. So now you'll see a theme that will come up here. So what was the second one? Okay, so that's gen we got a lot of people for gender identity. Uh, we can actually do another one for gender identity. Oh, let's do a fundamental tenet of critical race theory. Okay, let's see. Uh, I need three volunteers. Anybody? Good. We've got one. New, new volunteers is preferably a good thing. Good. Awesome, too. Wunderbar. I need one more. One more. Not everybody all at once. One, one at a time, please. I'm debating between two of these. Here, hold on one second. The primary mission of the university should be racial justice. Get in your head, three, two, one, move. Okay, that's so unfortunate for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say that the primary purpose of a university is to provide education, and education can be used to provide or to act towards racial equality, but it can also be a means of preparing people to advocate for other forms of equality. So I think that that should be part of it, but obviously, it is an educational institution. All right, let me do, I'm going to do something unusual. I am going to ask you guys to reset because I think this next question will help. Go back to the neutral one again. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. Three, two, one, move. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Wow. Okay. Okay. So now I... Uh, Wow, that's very interesting. Uh, wow, I was not expecting that at all. Why, why, why are you there? Well, I don't think that this is really a real tenet of critical race theory. I've never seen that from anyone advocating it or in any discussions of anti-racism. And You've never seen that? I've never seen that, not, not unironically, no. Yeah, I've, I've definitely heard it before, and it's something that um, 
I see a lot in, in the classroom as well. And not maybe directly, but that's like the doctrine underlying um, a lot of what we talk about in class. So you have heard that before? Yes. In class? Yes. Okay. Have you heard that before? That quote came out of Ibram X. Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. So you have heard it before? I would not use Kendi's quote. No, I would uh, use language that is does not imply... MLK. Education. Perhaps MLK, perhaps Malcolm X, perhaps Fred Hampton. You know, there are a lot of voices that we can consider, and I think that by focusing on one individual who perhaps has phrasing that we might find objectionable, it sort of buries the act. That's fair. That's very, very fair. All right, good. Thanks. Give him a round of applause. All right. Okay. So does anybody have something we can do, like a, a speed round on this? Oh, do you have one? Yeah, do you have one? Teachers or administrators should be allowed to acknowledge LGBTQ topics in school. Uh, K through 12? Yeah, sure, yeah. K through 12 only. Private or public or both? Uh, we'll go public. Yeah, I think that makes more sense. All right, if you want to come on down, come on down. Just three. One, two, one more. No, no, all at once. Yay, yay! Tell us what it is again. Um, teachers and administrators should be allowed to acknowledge LGBTQ topics in schools. Public, pu pu public schools. Yeah, okay, everybody got the question? Three, two, one, go. Okay, okay. Agree, it's too strongly agree, agree, disagree. Okay, let's start with the agree. Sure. So I think they should be able to acknowledge it um, for sure. I think they should be allowed to say some people have two moms, some people have two dads, and that's fine. But I don't think they should be the sole educators on the topic. I don't think, like, for example, kindergarten teachers should be saying, here are all the different genders that exist. I don't think that's necessarily their role. But I do think that when kids come to school, they're coming from real life. And so real life topics are going to seep into schools. Um, and so it's okay to talk about real life and that people do think these things and uh, I guess do um, in reality have these identities. Yeah, I, I kind of was, and I said something and she corrected me, I was kind of caught up in this idea of acknowledge. Like, what does that mean to you? Um, I would just say mention, just say that it exists and leave it at that. M m mention, okay. It's, it may be hard unless we're all, are we all on the same page about acknowledge, what the word acknowledge means? More or less, so not exactly. Okay. What, what do you, what do you why, why are you on disagree? So I think that parents should have a really big say in what their children are taught in public schools. And since a lot of parents wouldn't want this being talked about, um, I feel like teachers and administrators shouldn't be able to impose that on children without the parents' consent. Right. That's why... So, but that's not acknowledging, that's imposing. Well, by acknowledging that, you know, by acknowledging, maybe I guess acknowledging that it's like a normal or appropriate thing or a morally acceptable thing. And again, some people disagree with that. So I feel like that's, maybe some people will call that acknowledging as well. But I'm not at strongly disagree because I feel like if there's a student who is dealing with that issue and for some reason they want to talk to a teacher one-on-one -on -one or something about it, I think it's okay for the teacher to maybe, again, if the parents are okay with that, I think it's okay. Yeah, that's why this question in particular, that's why I like to think about these questions before because we needed the context for the question too. It's still a great question. Okay, so what if somebody lives in some kind of deranged community and um, in this community the individuals in the community have harbor some kind of animus against gay people and in the schools they're basically acknowledging that they're gay people and if you're gay you're just as you're just a decent human being allowed to be afforded to the rights of anybody else would the context matter to you like if it was some like some other part of the world um, I do think the context matters, again, because I think that the parents should have a great deal of control when it comes to teaching what is moral or what is acceptable. Um, even though, you know, they may not be having these conversations at home, I feel like, you know, expecting the, the educators and administrators to do that just gives them that opportunity to sort of subtly push that, even if they're not promoting it actively. Okay, that's fair. I'm going to come to you. Tell us why you believe that. I'm going to come on. I'm deaf in one ear, so I'm going to come to this side. Um, I mean, I think it should definitely be acknowledged in schools and like to to some level be like, you know, like Claire had said, like some people have this sort of family and things like that. And then when you get to sex education, which is a whole other thing, be like there are different ways to do this. 
But like it definitely should be acknowledged in school as and that should be a place where like kids can feel safe. If educators in the past had just mentioned like, hey, there are these different formats or some people, you know, like some people identify as a different gender and like that's okay. Or just saying that's a thing that can happen. I think that would have made a major difference in my life and a lot of my friends' lives too. So let me, I'm going to ignore you for a moment. Nothing personal. Did anything she say cause you to move one line to the left to, to slightly disagree? Um, no, not really. Um, because I still think that like, again, mentioning it gives it, you know, like she said, it gives it some sort of, um, I want to say like, like legitimacy. Right. right. And in some cultures, like in that example, you know, they don't really give any sort of moral legitimacy to that position. So I think like maybe it would be best if they didn't actually, you know, present that hatred and the animosity towards people. Um, but. Okay. So now here's the question. So you, there's a disagreement here, not, not an intense disagreement, but in, certainly intense enough. Without agreeing, do you feel you understand her position? Yes, I understand that having a teacher or someone that you look up to or an adult would help like legitimize and help you kind of feel better about your experience. That makes sense to me. Okay. Either one of you can answer this one. So there's obviously a disagreement. We can li literally see it. You disagree with her. But do you understand where she's coming from? Not entirely. I would, if you don't mind, could I just like pose a question just to like go off of what she had said? Yeah, but before you do that, yeah. I want to ask her to repeat. Oh, okay, yeah. So everybody's on the same page. So can you tell us why you stood in the disagree? Yeah, um, mainly it has to do with, you know, parents' involvement in their child's moral upbringing. That's mainly what I'm concerned with. And in places or for parents who don't want that being taught to their children, I think they have the right, have control over that. Okay, so not if you agree with her, but do you understand where she's coming from? I understand the logic behind what she's saying. I don't, it doesn't necessarily track for me, but I do understand that there are like exceptions to what she could be saying that are like not putting it together in my head, I guess. Okay. So you, you, again, not, I'm not asking you to agree. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, but you understand her position. Yes. Her line of thinking. Yes. I can, I can, that tracks with me. Yes. Yeah, I can say I definitely very much understand where you're coming from. And I came from a home that was very much not wanting to have those exposed to me. And that was where a lot of it came for me. And a lot of my friends also had those sorts of issues. Like, that's where a lot of animosity comes from in the home is the parents don't want this being taught, but that's just part of who their child is. And that's, you know, why a lot of inner turmoil comes up because they don't know these things. And even if the parents are okay with it, but they don't talk about it, like kids get scared or think, oh, my parents aren't going to like this, even if the parent is okay with it, if it's never mentioned. And a lot of parents don't talk about topics like that at home. A lot of parents don't do sex education at home or anything. So like those sorts of topics are kind of swept under the rug a lot by schools, by parents and things. So even just an educator mentioning and saying, hey, this is a thing could start that conversation and be able to like the air could be cleared between parents and children a little bit easier if someone mentions something. Okay, cool. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate that. Thanks. Uh, good. Thanks. Okay, I want to, yeah, have a seat, have a seat. You did, that's, I want to kind of, I meant that to be a bullet round, but it wasn't too bullety. Sometimes when you do this, you really have to think through the, the issues. Okay, do you feel that what we did tonight, we talked about calibrating. Do you felt it helped you, cal any, particularly the people who came up here, did you feel it helped you calibrate you did? T t t t tell me, come up real quick, tell me why, or I'll go to you. Oh yeah, go to the microphone, go to the microphone. How did it help you calibrate? Well, so first and foremost, we're taking really, really big topics and you're asking to be put on a line. And that is a tough place to be, because if you asked me to break down, particularly like the issues that we discussed, there might be a subsector that I might have moved on the line one way and there might be another part of that issue. I might move the other way. So being able to visualize the line, being able to hear that might help me think about those subcategories that I might have never thought before. Or maybe it sheds light on these nuanced issues that, it, you know, it's easy to say that you're here on a line, but there's lots of things that can move you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Anybody else who can, or if you didn't come up, but if you come up, did it help you calibrate to think, okay, now I know why I know this better. Like, okay, now I'm, why am I disagreeing with it? Okay. Now I know why I have a better Especially I tried to push back on people with what they believed. Um, basically, I feel like um, a lot of people's 
opinions, you know, where they stood on the line would change based on definitions of words that we're saying, or what does this mean, or what do we think it means, or what do most people mean when they say this? What do most people mean when they say discrimination or critical race theory, for example, or what do we mean by acknowledge? And I feel like defining these terms or recognizing that people define it differently can absolutely change, you know, totally. dramatically where you are in the line. Yeah, totally, 100%. That's why I think, too, um, the more controversial something is, the more you need to define it. So that's why, like, the def there's so much stuff around the defunding. And I have a feeling if we did that conversation, it would all boil down to, well, that's not what we mean by defunding. And that would be a, that would be a totally different quagmire where you need a new skill set. Okay. So the other thing is we're fractured, we're polarized, people aren't talking to each other. There's a philosopher by the name of Jürgen Habermas who says that the goal of communication should not be to persuade or convince, but mutual understanding. I personally believe that this is one of the best ways to promote mutual understanding. You guys are from FAIR, Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. I want you to just think about the idea of calibrating your beliefs, figuring out where you are, thinking what it would take for you to move, thinking what it would take for you to agree or disagree, finding out if someone else's reasons are sufficient for you to change your mind, and communicating with the goal of understanding someone's position as opposed to refutation because i do that everybody does that i make that mistake i'm all constantly general okay well you know or, or we try to win which is another problem but if you think about it you have to be wrong about some of your beliefs right so doing this is a way to figure out which beliefs you're wrong about could you have these conversations that we had tonight in class Every time I hear a positive that makes me happy, it makes me, it gives me hope for what's coming um, for the next generation. Uh, okay. Any further questions or comments or thoughts about tonight? My daughter was a uh, freshman in 2016 when the election happened, Trump versus Clinton. She was the only one on her dorm floor who voted for Trump, who admitted it anyway. Her roommate, she had three roommates. They were so upset with her. They were crying and they got mad at her and made it so uncomfortable. She had to come home for the rest of the week because it was so volatile. When I was in school, that never would have happened. It's a completely different world today. I just want to comment on that. It's hard to explain to somebody how much better your life will be when you have people around you that in that are your, you know that you're they're your true friends because what was it, the Star Trek episode you know um, th these are mere matters of mere ideological matters like you know the now that doesn't mean there aren't lines in the sand of course there are lines in the sand but someone's life is almost as a rule richer if they have people with whom they have they can discuss things and have disagreements about things because it's the only way to keep your own beliefs in check and it's the only way to have a relationship in which you say what you mean, and I say what I mean, and I know who you, you for who you are, and you know me for who you Nobody's bullshitting anybody, right? Nobody's, and we don't have a culture of fear that we're afraid to say th things. And I think that's a key component of this, and I, I just can't stress enough how I'd like young people to hear that, and to hear what you said, and hear what I said, and it's like, your life is just so much better if you have people in it. People can love you just as much if they have a difference of opinion if they think that their the police should be defunded by five percent or re i mean th th those things are really not matters of um abiding significance or ultimate consequence yeah and one one last comment i was thrilled when i heard about this event because then i went online and i saw that it was put on by the doubters club and so i went and checked that out because i hadn't heard of it and then i got directed to bridge usa which you're a part of also and Organizations like that are great. I mean, I'm, I'm glad to see stuff like that going on. Yeah, and just as a, we'll, we'll talk later because you, you, you do the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism and there's a lot of great stuff coming. All right, anyway, thank you everybody for coming. I appreciate it. I hope you got some practical things you can use out of it. Thanks. All right, so uh, first question is, what did you think about the event? I was surprised. I did kind of have some idea. I thought the activity part was really interesting, having people stand around and trying to see what it would take to move people. I thought it was great that the school had this event. I think that it's important that they have more events like these here on campus. There's certainly like a lot of opinions here on campus. I just think a good space like this, it's important to have. 
I thought it was interesting. I thought there was a lot of uh, interesting points brought up. I didn't necessarily uh, get necessarily a whole lot out of it as much as I thought I would, but uh, I thought it was interesting nonetheless. Yeah. Um, I thought it was definitely like pretty interesting. Um, I don't have like, you know, I'm not going to say like, oh, it was the best event I've ever been to, but like, I, I'm glad I got to come. I thought it was very interesting. And, uh, I, I like the techniques that were, impl uh, that were used to, uh, visually represent where we are on a particular viewpoint or particular topic and how we could come together to some form of understanding. I thought it was good. I thought it was fun liked it. Were you surprised by anything that you heard tonight? I was a little surprised by the description of, I guess, woke ideology as a cancer. I mean, I can see the metaphor there. It's, I can see how some people might find that a little offensive, you know, if they've had someone who's had cancer and, you know, obviously the person in the film felt comfortable making that comparison. Other people might not. So I thought that was surprising, but I did think it was kind of surprising with the uh, the questions uh, for critical race theory, how we all ended up in the same place. I was not expecting that. So I think that was pretty interesting as well. Not really surprised, but I don't know, like, like my curiosity was like peaked, basically. As, um, like the video that they showed earlier in the event, I felt that it was a, a bit one-sided, honestly. So... Um, I can agree that there are some, sometimes people take things overboard, but I, I think that um, the approach to, or the approach to the woke movement, um, like their viewpoint was a bit one-sided. See, this is what I mean. <laughs> you're doing great. You're doing fine. Yeah, yeah you're doing good. Uh, no, I think it probably met my expectations from what I had expected of the event. I think, yeah, I don't think I really was surprised at all. Not really. I kind of expected, uh, I didn't expect like the format that we had, but I expected there to be like certain viewpoints here tonight. Um, some of my friends and I had discussed coming anyway, so I knew they were going to be here. And like with it being Ohio, there are certain like viewpoints that are more prevalent and not, and not so like I figured there would be some of the viewpoints here. Not particularly, um, although it was a lot of good food for thought. And I think some of that's in this, <laughs> um, but uh, I will be looking into the uh, Delphi arguments. Uh, Nope, not really surprised. Do you feel like you learned anything from this event? I learned that um, it can be pretty hard to move people on what they believe. I mean, obviously we talk a lot about partisan divide, but you don't often see it demonstrated as clearly as you did there. I learned that, um, if anything, controversial topics deserve to be explored more. It shouldn't just be automatically picked up and agreed upon. I think that people should discuss things more, and I feel like there should be a safer space for people to discuss things. What I appreciated about the event is um, the conversation after with people speaking at the mic, talking about how they should be able to voice their opinion with their friends and not lose that friend, you know. I've had conversations with friends where they've gotten violently angry at me <laughs> over a topic, yeah, and um, I just said, I didn't say I was against a topic. I <laughs> so, so I think that's important for people to remember. No, not really. I wouldn't say that I necessarily learned anything other than just like, I learned about the methods that were used, but I don't know that I took, got anything to take away from the event necessarily, yeah. I wouldn't say my views have really changed. I mean, like the ones that we discussed tonight, I'm fairly firm in and like, I heard the other sides, but there are sides I've been hearing for years. And so I guess it was it was nice to have that conversation and it not be heated. Um, but like I wasn't really swayed on anything. And they're like, you know, just reiterations of what I've heard in the past. So it was nice to hear different sides and not be yelled at. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, specifically, like how to build a common understanding. Yeah, I think it's helpful to learn this technique and, and know that, you know, by doing it, that people can have kind of better conversations and nobody got heated or anything like that. So I think that's that's a nice example to see what to do. Do you see anything differently now than you did before? If so, what? How has your view changed? I guess I sort of have a better understanding of some of the rhetoric that people have pushed back against when it comes to questions of critical race theory or anti-racism. Uh, I guess I was not as familiar with particular sections that people took issue with because that's not something that I had necessarily seen a whole lot of, so that was sort of an informative thing. Not necessarily that it 
changed my mind. I'd have to do more research, but yeah, I think that was enlightening. Um, I don't see anything really differently. Just again, just been reminded um, to explore things, um, controversial topics, uh, more widely. You know. No, I think my views are pretty much the pretty much the same. I didn't really have, hear anything that changed my my viewpoints on anything, or persuade me anyway. Uh, not particularly, but uh, but it's always good to hear various viewpoints. I don't think any of my views changed now. Do you think that you can talk in your classes about this event? Uh, yes, I think that in the classes that I'm in, I could talk about this. There are very few, if any, situations that I would not feel comfortable talking about this. I think so. Um, I was actually in a class this semester where certain topics became heated. Um, um, but I do feel that um, the professors at least do provide that space for us to voice our opinion. And um, while I know certain students are against it, um, we're encouraged to speak our minds. So, Yeah, I think I can. Uh, I would probably bring it up in like a political science class or something like that. Yeah. All right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, like most people, at least here at Capitol and most people like my age group and a little bit older, young, mostly a little bit uh, younger, a little bit older, like we are have gotten a lot better at having like calmer discussions and can have actual discussions. Um, really, the only time that I wouldn't feel comfortable would be like the large age gaps. And if it's something is brought up in a miscommunicative way, then that's when it gets a little like uncomfy sometimes. But for the most part, I'd be comfortable talking about these topics. Yeah. Um, I could, but I would have to be ready for some backlash and a lot of assumptions being made um, that are negative. So if I'm willing to put up with that on a good day where I'm feeling confident, yes. Um, on another day, maybe not. What did you think about the video specifically? Um, I do think that it was a little sensationalist. And I see, you know, if you have strong feelings on that, I can see why that would be the perspective you would go on. But I do think that it might not be doing the best job of representing the thing that it's trying to criticize. And I think that that's not productive to uh, discourse. Uh, um, I thought it was interesting. I thought it was a little bit sensationalist, a little bit uh, exaggerated. Uh, but I understood the intention of it. So, yeah, that was, yeah. It felt very unclear and like not, it didn't really define the topics it was discussing very well. I felt um, it didn't define the term wokeism at all. It just kind of said of like, it, it felt very malicious at points. Um, and it just didn't really go in depth into what it showed in discussing what the, like it was believed that it thought wokeism was and how it could address it. It was just like, oh, this is a cancer on our society, which like not to mock him at all. I'm, you know, this story is very inspiring and I'm glad he is like doing all right now, but like phrasing it that way, it was just like, it didn't identify any issues. It was just making, it was villainizing other viewpoints it felt. It was very powerful, and uh, especially the uh, the cancer analogy, I think, really speaks to where we are um, in the society. I liked the video. I think it's always really helpful to get the perspective of somebody who is, you know, black or of a minority to talk about, like, no, it does not actually feel good when people are doing these things, even though they think it's going to help me. Um, and, you know, talking about like the victim mentality and all of that, I think it's really refreshing to hear people say that. Because if you are someone who's white or like a straight white male type thing, you can't say that without sounding like you just, you know, are a bigot or prejudiced, something like that. So I think it's important for people who kind of have that status to actually give a voice to that opinion. Uh, because unfortunately, it's a lot harder for everyone else to do so. And he spoke about it in a very authentic, genuine way from his own experience. And I really liked that. How can we improve? Uh, as far as the event goes, I think it would be helpful to have more time. Obviously, there were a lot of discussions or topics people wanted to discuss. And I think that being able to flush that out more would have been more productive um, just because these are very big topics and it's hard to do them in a very short amount of time. I think what you guys did here tonight was actually like really great. I think more students, if there is a way for you guys to get more students involved, I would like improve it. But I think this was great. Um, I think having a section where you open it up to like the full group would be good because I think it's like difficult to get a full gauge of opinion, like range of opinions when you just focus on three people. I understand like the time constraint and stuff, but if there was a way to lengthen the time, the time limit, I think that would be a good addition would be to open it up to like a big group discussion afterward maybe. 
there wasn't a lot of discussion. Um, so my friends and I were talking before we were heading out about it and it just felt like there wasn't a lot of discussion. There was a lot of expression and like exposure to other things, but there wasn't much discussion between things it felt like, or like when there was, it was like, it felt a little awkward, not awkward and like you know, uncomfortable, just awkward and sort of like a janky to use that term. It just felt like a little weird. Okay. Yeah. Like the flow of it was a little weird. Uh, I would have liked to just see like a little bit more time so that we can engage in this process for even longer because we only asked a few questions and only had a few participants. I think it would be great to do this for like a couple hours, like a little bit longer, which I know might be a challenge for a lot of people, but I could just definitely use more of it, honestly. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Those are all my questions.